great innovation stories make change possible. Each week on the Innovation Storytellers podcast, I invite innovation leaders to share how they overcame the obstacles to introduce breakthrough ideas to the world through the power of story. I'm featuring guests from Tesla, TD Ameritrade, Corning, Cisco, Bloomberg, and so many more. Listen in to learn how you can tell a more effective innovation story and change the future for the better. Welcome back. I'm Susan Lindner. I'm your host of Innovation Storytellers. And today I've invited another fellow storyteller to join me in this discussion around innovation and getting your point across to the audiences that really need to hear your message. I'm joined today by Graham Brown, who is the founder and CEO of Pickle & Co., uh, an award-winning podcast agency that is AI-powered, data-driven, and B2B-focused in its clientele, um, and is based in Singapore. Uh, He is a published author on the subject of the digital transformation of communication, uh, works including the Human Communication Playbook, the Mobile Youth, Voices of a Connected Generation, and which he documents the rise of mobile culture in the early 2000s in Japan, China, Africa, and India, and also brand love, how to build a brand worth talking about. So we're going to be talking about all of those beautiful things, in addition to Graham's fantastic background in telecom in the 2000s. So um, for any of you too young to remember the advent (laughs) and the giant shift going from, you know, that phone that lived on your grandmother's wall with a dial (laughs) or maybe some buttons, if you were lucky, my house, we still had dials um, on our phones. Um, But it was a massive, massive shift taking place. And I wanted, I want to talk about that. So let's get into it. Graham, welcome to Innovation Storytellers. Hey, Susan. It's great to be here. I'm excited. What a good warm up as well. <laughs> well, thank you. And, you know, this conversation that I like to have with other communicators never begins with where we are in this moment. There is a foundation of um, why this became so relevant for each of us. I know my listeners know that, you know, my desire to tell a great story was all about helping women shift from prostitution to entrepreneurship in the brothels of Thailand in the 90s. That's where I found the power of storytelling to really transform lives. But it sounds like you identified the power of story and really listening to your customer, really listening to groups and audiences when you were talking about this convergence of big telecom and Gen Z youth, like that these two things were really colliding in the early 2000s and you were watching it all unfold. So tell us about A, how you got into that because nobody majors in this topic when they're in university, (laughs) number one. And number two, what did you see when that cataclysm was happening? So how did I get, you're right, I didn't graduate with a mobile youth degree. (laughs) I graduated, actually in 95, I graduated with a degree in AI, which was completely useless back then in 95. I mean, fast forward to today, next century, I would be sort of picking out jobs in Google and Meta. But back then, I think the only options were you could go into maybe MIT and teach if you knew somebody. And that was it. So with my AI degree, they gave me one option, which was teach English in Japan. And so I took it. And, you know, the requirement actually was, do you speak English? So I thought, yeah, I can do that. Was this the JET program? No, I I applied to the JET program and I applied to like private schools as well. There were like a lot of private, JET was sort of a government run program, but the, you know, it was all sort of very much depending on, you know, we want to have a blonde head guy in sort of North Tokyo. And I didn't sort of fit into that, you know, the box filling matrix that they had. So I, Got a start with a private school, had a large national chain, got my passport to Japan because Japan in 95, and we're talking about innovation, was still it. You know, you're talking Sony, Toshiba, TDK, you know, those 120, 180 tapes, all those kind of things. It was still, you know, CDs, MDs, it was still very innovative. So cut a long story short, at the time I was in Japan, 95 to 96 to 98, um, the mobile phone industry was really taking off. 
and bef- ahead of the world. And Japan had the advantage because it, it was a very consensual in its approach to innovation as opposed to, you know, the more sort of Western models, which are more diverse. The fact if you have this sort of very top-down model of innovation, you can force innovation through very fast, but it's very inflexible long-term. Mm. So they got it, they got products out fast. You know, NTT Docomo was a world leader in uh, mobile internet, one of the first to have mobile payments in 98. They had like an app store like way beyond uh, Apple in terms of their sort of innovation tech you know, their capabilities. But what was really interesting in all of this is, you know, I was teaching kids, I was teaching teenagers as well as a few sort of older businessmen. And I was witnessed teenagers, I'm talking girls, 13, 14, 15, come to class, initially bringing in these little, uh, what they call pocket bell, pocket bells. And they were like little pages, like pink pages, but they were like, you know, their dad's pages initially, and they started painting them. I was like curious, like, why are you carrying a page? Why do you need a pager? Right. You're 13, 14. <laughs> the one thing I learned is like how they were corrupting these uh, technologies. So what they were doing, because the original pages, you couldn't send text. So you could only type numbers in the old days, like 95, 96. Oh, I so had they a used pager. To- that was, that was it my just... grand piece of technology as an <laughs> epidemiologist working for the Centers for Disease Control in New York City. There you go. It was, it was medical right. professionals who had them, right? <laughs> right. And you had a good reason because you were on call or, but you know, for kids to have them, it was just strange. But I kind of discovered that they were, they were creating these languages. So for example, if they said, you know, I want to meet you at Shibuya, which is a sort of a big meeting place in Tokyo, they would type in like the numbers, Shibuya. And then a time. So I'd see you at Shibuya at 7.30. And so they, were, they created the first versions of text speak in like 96, 97. And there were lots of stories about how young people were like positively or corrupting technologies to make them better. And we've seen this obviously with MP3s, file sharing, social media, music, et cetera, et cetera, later on. But that really inspired me when I came back to London in the late nineties, looking for a start of my own business. I thought the only thing I really know is what's going on over there. And I've seen this opportunity. So that's where I got my start was knocking on the doors, literally a mobile phone company saying, I've seen the future. (laughs) And they all said to me, we don't do kids. (laughs) Little did they know, right? Um, the, the biggest part of their revenue and the driver of their own innovation in the next two decades to come. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you go, you know, if you look at the advertising in the late 90s, it was all aimed at road warriors, men, middle aged. And, you know, it was like carrying the big phones, the big chunky things that you mentioned. And, you know, that was the focus because they were the high paid individuals. Nobody, even if you look, you know, text messaging, which has generated over a trillion dollars of revenue for the mobile phone industry, trillion dollars, you know, that was first included in the mobile phone protocol, GSM, as an afterthought. Nobody thought about charging for it. It was actually used by engineers as a test. So you actually, in the late nineties, the first text messages you ever received were these random messages you got on your phone and it said, test, ignore I'm serious. Like you'd get this, what's that? You look at your phone and it'll say test, ignore. But then teenagers thought, "Mm, what is this thing that that keeps coming into my phone? Can I actually use it? And they found they could send text messages for free because nobody thought about charging for these engineers tool. And then they realized, actually, if engineers can send this for free, I can send it to my mates for free. And that's where text messaging started. So what interestingly they taught the mobile phone industry how to make money out of data. Amazing. Amazing. And I remember at the beginning, right, you'd get the, you know, text message and and data fees may apply. And you're like, right. And this is like, this is when we bought data plans and we bought by the minutes that came after. But, you know, before the podcast, you and I were talking about, you know, focus groups, that you would do with youth mobile, right? And getting people to really understand, you know, to see it live. Can you share some of those experiences around where we get blind to the innovation that's sitting right in front of us? Because for so many of us, we don't want to be set in our 
conceptual thinking about who our customer is, what they need, what they respond to, Hmm. um, and how to serve them, not just in this moment, but moving forward. But it starts off with our own bias um, as innovators, right? We might be stuck on a particular hypothesis, like you said, you know, the road warrior hypothesis um, for far too long Hmm. before we begin to dive into a new target market. You're right. The bias is key. And even before people started talking about bias as a thing in the corporate world, it was very strong. And there were some great examples. There were some wonderful stories of taking young people into corporates. And it was like, meet the kids. (laughs) You know, it was like bringing... The the irony was, Susan, like they had kids every breakfast table every morning. They would sit there and their 13-year-old daughter would be texting on the phone. They saw it. And yet, you know, when they got their corporate clothes on, their whole mindset changed. When they were in corporate mode, they behaved very differently. And in one instance, you know, I remember with a music company, a record label. So in, you imagine 2000s, record labels were still relevant back then. And, um, you know, they brought young people in to do these foc- focus groups in the days when, you know, just stuffed them with pizza and ask them questions and then somebody would kind of like surreptitiously write this down in the corner. And it, it very sort of, I mean, you know, as an anthropologist, I'm sure you could see all the kind of like red flags and alarm bells going with, you know, this is a method for understanding how people get data and understand innovation, how, you know, biased and how unrealistic it is. That they would bring young people in to ask them about music because at the time, if you think about it, in the early 2000s, music revenues were on the way down. You know, they hadn't yet monetized ringtones. That hadn't really oh, happened wow. yet. Remember yeah. buying ringtones. <laughs> right. Yeah. That had, and they were losing a lot of money to Napster and the MP3 file sharing. And obviously, uh, we hadn't yet seen iTunes take off. So we were kind of in this gap period where they were lacking innovation and hold, you know, trying to very defensively hold on to their position. Or how can we squeeze a bit more money out of CDs? And I remember like after asking these teenagers about their habits and you know technology they were using, they, they said, no, thanks for your time. And on the way out, grab some gifts on the table. And this sort of these teenagers kind of shuffled out the room. And they all sort of glanced at this table where these stacks of all these kind of CDs were lying there. And they just kind of looked at it and went, nah, and walked out. And the biggest learning point for the execs. And, you know, there was a group of, they must have been 30s or 40 years old, was that those last 30 seconds were actually, they didn't value even their products for free. You couldn't even give this stuff away. They, you know, didn't even want a CD, didn't want it in their house, didn't know what to do with it. So it's, you know, you talk about bias, it's there right in front of their faces. So the, the real work is to be happen there, isn't it? How do you take people out of that situation so they can be exposed and a bit vulnerable? Yeah. And to find a way to put those biases at bay. And I think, you know, when we work in innovation, there's someone who needs to be going, don't miss that. Mm -hmm. Right. That wasn't a small thing, you know, and sometimes these things are around us all the time. I think it's why we also need just some downtime, some quiet space so we can stop and observe what's happening around us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that you mentioned earlier is, you know, the corrupting of the technology, right? That they were taking these, Mm. that they were taking these um, pagers effectively and painting them and making them their own, right? Which is such a Japanese cultural thing and Mm -hmm. also such a teenage girl thing. And, um, you know, which gave rise to like the sidekick, you know, that we need, (laughs) we want, or even, you know, the, the, um, the iPod with that click Mm -hmm. wheel, that design actually matters, to us. And we care about what things look like and feel like and how it, they relate to us personally and never underestimate the desire of a teenage girl to keep or spread a secret, right? Mm. The fact that you could, you know, say, I'm going to meet up at this particular place in Tokyo, but use code is the greatest thing since passing notes in code, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's addictive and wonderful and fantastic. So um, these are all things that can also help to make our technologies and our innovations stickier when Mm. we get inside the hearts, not just the minds of the folks that we're talking to. Yeah. What we tend to do, and this is 
why you need that person, like you say, to kind of prompt you and poke you is that we get defensive. We look at that corruptive behavior and we immediately see it as a threat. Even though those teenage girls, all they're trying to do is find a better way of using this. And you look at the history of a lot of technology of how it's the hackers, you know, these people that existed on the fringe who took a product and made it better because they found out a different way of using it. And the owner of that product becomes defensive and they can even get legal about this and threaten action to stop people doing these things. I mean, file sharing, classic example. If we didn't have file sharing, we wouldn't have Spotify. We wouldn't have the app stores that we do now. But that started off with people effectively illegally sharing copyrighted material, right? Because the reason why they were doing it and the reason why teens were sharing is because that whole era of growing up with vinyl, you remember those wonderful 12 inch artworks, gatefolds that you used to get. And you'd go around your friend's house and you'd rifle through their record collection and you'd pick up a record, pull it out of the box and talk about it and look at it. It's art and all the design on it. And you'd read the stories and it became this social tool for people to interact. And when that went into CDs, that all got lost. Right. And that's the point. These, these products are social tools for young people. So if they lose that social currency that they used to have, they look for other stuff. And we've seen, for example, I mean, there are very positive benefits coming out of this, that if you correlate um, cigarette consumption and cell phone usage by teenagers throughout the late 90s into the early 2000s and even up to 2010, it's almost like an inverse correlation. Hmm. Because what happened was, is that, and I distinctly remember this, before I went to Japan, 1995, I remember sitting in a bar, and I was a, a young graduate at the time, and everybody put their cigarette packets out on the table, you know, and each one was like a different brand, a different statement about themselves. And, you know, there was a Marlboro and blah, 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 blah a Camel and stuff like that. And they said things about you. And when I came back from Japan and then had the same situation, 98, 99, they weren't cigarette packets. They were mobile phones. And Ooh. so it, you don't need to be a cigarette manufacturer, but any manufacturer looking at that thinking, oh, well, my competition is the other guy in my sector, but actually it's not. It's the other people who are innovating in such a way that they're eating up that psychological, emotional benefit that your product used to give your customers. And that's really important because people don't see it in that way. They only see it in terms of the nuts and bolts and the widgets that they produce. Or the problem to be solved, right? But it's also solving an oral fixation. It's solving a status issue. It's yeah. a communications uh, opportunity. And sooner or later, it was going to be mobile payments too. And our whole social lives would live in that little device. Hmm. Yeah, you're right about the status and the communication. If you're a smoker back in those days, you used to go outside and outside the office, have a cigarette with somebody else in the break time. It was a social thing, right? Yes, relationships were started in the smoking side. Yeah. <laughs> so That's yeah, it, right. right. And it also, um, and maybe it also made us a little bit more insular, you know, in terms of uh, yeah. of what that did to us. Less lung cancer, though. So that's a plus. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, so, it's amazing all the years and years that they've been banging on to young people about not smoking, and then the mobile phone came over and solved the problem, right? Yeah, well, that uh, until the vape came, but then, um, <laughs> but then you could also, um, you know, the other part of that is kids were saying they got so many messages from "Don't text and drive." Mm. And at this point, they had become so addicted to texting. They're like, "Yeah, thanks. I don't want to buy a car either." And so I remember going to an innovation mm. um, lecture where the teen cell phone use was the greatest indicator of whether or not a young person was going to get their license on time and mm. buy a car within the next year. And it turned out people were delaying even getting their licenses or even the desire to learn to drive because they got the message so clearly you can't text and drive. Thank you. I'll keep texting. Wow. How about that? There's a great example, isn't it? Of like one industry being impacted by another, which are completely unrelated. And then if you even look, you know, if you go back a few generations with cars, you know, if you think about movies like American Graffiti, that, you know, they really are 
the symbolization of the right of passage, aren't they? For if you're a teenager, you get a car. If, you know, if you're a teenage boy, you can have girls in the car. You can drive around town with your buddies. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. It, that's what it's all about. And it's like your first taste of living outside and communicating outside of your parental control, right? Because you can go and do things. You can hang out in places, right? And yet, this small device came along that could do many of the things that a car could do. Sure, it couldn't take you from A to B, but it could get you to communicate with people outside of your physical locus, your domain, right? And it could give you status. If you had a phone, you were like the kid now at school who had the car, right? You had this status symbol that other people didn't have. So in that sense, it played on many of the psychological drivers that cars had. I mean, you ask any auto manufacturer, you say, how does this compete with mobile phones? They would say, it doesn't but they're both competing for the same wallet. That's the point when it comes to innovation is that that wallet is fixed. It's a pie. If you're going to have a big slice, I'm going to have less, right? And that's how it works, right? Especially with young people who have a fixed pie, or we all do really, but it's more obvious there because there's less competition in different factors. Well, and less opportunity for credit card debt. (laughs) So So far. So, but you know, shifting that viewpoint on, you know, A, being a great listener, B, understanding the stories that our customers are telling us and our willingness to receive them, but also, you know, thinking about how we're com- communicating our stories of innovation to others. And, mm. um, you know, this feels very meta is two podcasters talking to each other about <laughs> about storytelling and about innovation through a podcast, what do innovators not know about podcasting that you think would be helpful for them to understand in terms of getting their message across? Hmm. It's interesting that a lot of people go into podcasting thinking this is the message that I want to get across and this is what I want to talk about. But actually, really what's important is what does your audience want to hear? What's their problem? What's their frustration, their pain points? You know, what's broken in their life? And, you know, there is absolutely a message that you need to convey, which is obviously the solution to that. But what tends to happen is that a lot of people start out putting their stall out saying, this is what I know. And yet people don't care what you know unless they know that you care. Mm. That's Wait, the, can you say that again? Can you say that again so we really get that? People don't care what you know unless they know that you care. Mm. And okay. there's a real sense that what makes a great podcaster is the ability to speak to the pain, the frustration of the listener. Yeah, you know, I really understand you. Like, I've been there. You know, I, I'm like yourself, like the people you've had on your podcast, that what they're really good at is you understand that that audience, that avatar, and who exactly they are, what their frustrations and why they bang their head against the wall. And what's the big change that's really, you know, keeping them up at night. The challenge is, is that we switch expert mode on when we go onto a podcast. And really what we should be doing is saying, you know, okay, let's just turn that off a little bit and let's talk about the problem. What is the problem? And I understand it. And like, I'm walking in their shoes and I empathize with them, right? So to answer your question, I would say that it's really, you know, you, you've said it yourself about listening. It's really about starting with the problem. That's what a lot of people kind of miss the opportunity on when they go on a podcast. It's like, stay there. You spend all your time talking about the problem and you've got your audience already. And yeah, I think we kind of go into pitch mode a little bit, don't we? Maybe it's training. Maybe it's corporate expectation. Get the PowerPoint out. Do the bullet points. But the reality is, is that doesn't really engage people, does it? I mean, I'm sure you sat through a lot of presentations yourself where you had death by PowerPoint on the other end. So I think we've got to kind of switch out of that a little bit. And that takes a bit of rework, doesn't it? So this, this medium of communicating around innovation through a podcast, what makes this, what makes this medium powerful? And why do you think stories transmit so well here? Hmm. Yeah. I love the fact we're getting to storyteller and I know you, I mean, you're a good storyteller yourself, Susan. Uh, even when we first 
chatted off air we exchanged our personal stories and how important that is to connect with each other because you really get a place of person and you know even though that may not be an experience that you understand you really understand their backstory a little bit like all good movies you kind of understand through the backstory of the hero we care about that person so the point about podcasting is firstly it's long form you know i'm not this isn't a tiktok video is it where we've got 30 seconds to do a silly dance and then you know how many likes do we get it's long form so we have the bandwidth to go deep into the subject area and I, if you think about stories in themselves like what do stories do if you look at sort of your brain on stories this is what we don't really appreciate i suppose we know the power of story you know we all know the power of gather around when we were kids you know the, how that kind of engages and how stories took us on magic carpet rides and on journeys and we we know the wonder and the magic of stories and yet we don't really necessarily draw a line between that and the world of business. And the missing part here is that what if you look at how our brain functions, that the human brain has a weakness, and that is that it cannot distinguish between past and present and future. The human brain it doesn't understand, doesn't have a concept of past or future. It only understands experience. So even when you sort of visualize something in the future, you are actually in a way experiencing it just in the same, you would see a dream or if you like remember, or you listen to a song and it makes you cry because you remember, you know, that time when you, you and whoever, you know, the story. So we, we experience it. We don't understand that that's past. It's, it's all the same. And so because of that, when it comes to business and particularly innovation, the challenge with innovation is that what you're doing as an innovator, whether you're a startup founder or a team leader or a CEO or Steve Jobs on stage, is you're pitching somebody an idea which is an unknown future. And the one thing that human beings dislike more than anything is the unknown future. Because, you know, you look at all movies, the bad guy is always this sort of formless unknown entity. That's like the worst, you know, dark Lord, Dr. Evil or whatever. We really, Darth you know, Vader. Th- th- mm-hmm. Darth Vader, you know, the- Sauron, Sauron, whatever it is, you know, thousands and thousands of years, we've been telling stories about the, the unknown futures and how we're fearful of them. But what a story does is it connects an unknown future with a known experience. That's the power of a story. Because what it does, even if you look at the most basic form of a story, which is an analogy, which is what I call short form storytelling, Mm. which is where you say, it's like the A of B. It's like the Uber of pet care. I just made that up. But if I said it's the Uber of pet care, that's my, my startup's the Uber of pet care. You're like, I can kind of understand it, what it's about. I understand the mobile Uber. grooming truck that comes to your house that, that shares on demand. Your <laughs> and there might be a taco in there. We don't know, but it's a possibility. How about a, a delivery at the same time? <laughs> that's pretty cool. Well, you get the, you already get the idea. Right. We and have so, a mental picture that starts churning, right? When we use exactly. a metaphor. Mm-hmm. That, that analogy is extremely powerful. And that's how all stories work because they, you know, if you look at the archetypes, you read things like Joseph Campbell's hero with a thousand faces, you know, the hero is pretty much the same, whether it's Gilgamesh or Jesus Christ or Luke Skywalker is the same movie, same plot line, same story, like regurgitated thousands and thousands of times. The point being is actually the reason why we like that. And the reason why the next movie you'll go to see on Netflix or at the theater will have the same plot line. It's because we enjoy it when somebody takes the unknown away from us and connects it with a familiar, you know, oh, that ending is how I would expect it. We like that known Hollywood ending. People enjoy it. That's why you don't have weird endings in blockbuster movies is because they become unfamiliar. And the point of what a story does is it allows people to put that unknown into a box so probably the greatest example of this is if we take something like Steve Jobs when he stood on stage and sold the iPod. You know, he didn't stand up and say this was the world's best MP3 player, which interestingly Microsoft was doing with the Zune. 
he stood up and said, this is a tool for the heart. If you think about it, we understand that. We understand heart. We understand music. We understand love, connection, relationships, feelings. And this is what it's about. And it's a tool to help us connect with all of those feelings. And that, yeah, I get it. And that's a great example of an analogy. It was a story. And stories don't have to be, you know, Epic. epics. That's yeah. the word. Bingo. <laughs> they don't have to be like these trilogies. They can be a one-liner. It can be even one word. Yeah, but a great story like that is like good Danish furniture. You know, it is handcrafted and hewn where you can't see the joints. All you see is the beautiful grain and the simplicity of the wood. And that takes for freaking ever, right? It's not, it's like, we wish like, oh yeah, it's a one line story or it's a beautiful tagline like that, right? A thousand songs in your pocket, or it connects at the heart. Like, that takes effort to hone away all the dross and the crap mm. and get to the good stuff. Otherwise, we get stuck with such and such as a B2B platform specifically for the optimization and utilization of blah, 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 right? I mean, you just like... Well, the, the corporate word. say, can you put B2B in that tagline? <laughs> it's like, it's like, can you add that? Can you just, just put that in there? Can I you get could, our company name in it? I kill you. Thank you. <laughs> You're absolutely right. It's you know, the whittling it's, of the, the arrow, the isn't it? It's the whittling, right? It's the, it's the um, craftsmanship that mm. allows you to keep honing down until you get to essence. And that's yeah. not easy. And the other thing about great, that great design, you know, that feels like such an intangible mm. and yet takes such incredible work and thoughtfulness um, is, is the emotion it's intending to convey. And so yes. we often talk about, storytelling. I often talk about storytelling, not just as a pen and paper exercise, but a neurochemical one. Mm. And so getting really clear about what are the emotions we want to have unleashed on our listener, and then being a really thoughtful guide through those emotions. So that includes, you know, an understanding of how cortisol and adrenaline work in the body when the movie starts with, um, you know, a, a car crash you know, and the desire to make the heart beat faster, you know, and then, you know, or I often use the example of Bambi's mother getting killed within the first five minutes of a nice children's Walt Disney I movie. I cried when that happened. We all cried, right? And that <clears throat> individual, <laughs> that man made a decision to say, I want to break the hearts of children around the world. Mm. When I start this, I want to make them feel they're most vulnerable. I want to invoke a child's greatest fear. I want to put it on a platter and serve it to them. And then I'm going to guide them through that forest with their happy little friends, Thumper and the rest. And I'm going to take them to the journey that now makes it okay. But these are decisions that we make in storytelling and mm. story design that says, what is the arc of the emotion that I take my listener through? And where do I want to get them to by the end? And so it becomes really clear that if we don't have a handle, not only on the words that we're expressing, the time that we're using, but also when the story is over, what do I want people to do? What do I want them to feel? What do I want them to remember? And, you know, to, to, as a consummate storyteller is to keep those three keys in mind. Otherwise the words just leave us. But when we attach those neurotransmitters, we exude a feeling in the body, my palm sweat, my heart races. Now the story is my own because it lives in my body, not just my memory. And so it becomes a really powerful concoction of neurochemicals, right? And bodily responses that say, I will never forget that story. And it's your, you know, your examination of our brain doesn't know the difference between past and future. And you can still go, I cried hmm. from the time that you were a little kid. And so I just, I think it's, I think this is part of the reason why I love storytelling is that it involves every part of us, every part of us. And it's such a primal a primal means of communication that it can't not work. Hmm. And we just keep looking for new mediums like this one, like in podcasting, where we get the chance to do that again. We get the chance to connect to the primal parts of us that just want to hear a story that just that gather around, like you said. Yeah. yeah. You're so right about the emotional aspect of it. 
it's primal, isn't it? It speaks. It's almost like a the main line to our soul, which yes. cuts through thousands of years of layers. Right. Well, it still speaks to us. I mean, you, the stories. I mean, even if you go way back, you go right back. I mean, those cave paintings in Lascaux, which were dated at twenty six thousand BC potentially, and you know you've got pictures of buffalo stampedes. This is in the southwest of France. Right. And this, so, bear in mind, these are nearly thirty thousand years old, like prehistory, pre agricultural revolution, and. They were these tribes painting these pictures on these walls, and there's such a beautiful there's such a beautiful part of it in that Lascaux painting where a child of potentially five years old, because of the bone structure of her hand, had basically dipped her hand in the paint, which was whatever it's like some sort of ochre and like uh, ash mixed together, and stuck her hand on the wall. And there's this handprint which is nearly thirty thousand years old on the wall, and like if you were to give a paint pot to a kid today in any nursery around the world, regardless of what cultural language, they would do the same thing. Exactly. And I find it that 30,000 years, there's that primal aspect of saying, hey, this is me, folks. I'm here. That kid is saying, look, this is an expression of me. This is about me. I'm part of this as well. And that's timeless. Right. And that is that drive to tell a story and be heard. Connect, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, you think about, you talk about podcasts now and like we're seeking out new mediums. How will that sort of changed over the last few years with the pandemic? How a lot of people took to podcasting during that time? Really, because, you know, the total addressable market for loneliness is 7 billion people, right? That's sort of something we've never solved. We're always seeking out. And in many ways, it's like, it's oxygen for us, right? I mean, it's not just, we talk about kids being addicted to technology, but we're all addicted to what technology does for us, which is help us connect. That's right. You know, if you, if you take away, you know, if you even look at what they do to people when they put them in solitary confinement, which is like for the worst offenders in society, you know, you lock them up, incarcerate them, and then you put them in solitary because they're too bad for prison or jail, is that the actual cognitive function of their brain declines. Dramatically. Because without human contact, we, we lose it, literally. That's right. Gosh, Graham, this has been like such an enlivening conversation. Um, everything from you know, <laughs> Japanese trend-setting youth all the way up to the real heartfelt work of great innovation storytelling. So thank you so much for joining me on the podcast yeah. today. How can people get in contact with you? And who should be getting in contact with you, Graham? Yeah, so firstly... Where you can find me, go to my website, which is grahamdbrown.com. D is the important part because otherwise you get the wallpaper company, <laughs> Graham Brown. It's a different experience, different type of innovation, different type of storytelling. And then there's the other guy, the, the country and Western singer we're talking about, T. Graham Brown. That's not me. So it's Graham D. Brown. Um, if you're interested in podcasting, if you're interested in, you know, how you can tell better stories to communicate as a brand and how you can talk about your work in more engaging ways, whether it's data storytelling or, you know, talking about your brand in a more human way, then have a look at some of the work there. It links out to the work that I'm involved in. And if you're interested, happy to have a chat. Fantastic. Graham Brown, thank you so much for joining us on the Innovation Storyteller. So it was just a pleasure having you. Thank you, Susan. Now you might be asking, Susan, why innovation storytelling? Well, the truth is that an innovation story told well not only breaks down communication barriers so you can drive change and new growth, but it also helps other people remember and champion your work. And it propels your best ideas forward faster to secure you the runway, resources, and recognition you so richly deserve. In other words, stories are memory-making devices that significantly reduce the time it takes for you and your innovation to be understood. But like many leaders, you probably never got the memo that storytelling skills would be central to your success. Well, I've got some good news for you. It's not too late because I've got you covered. Whether you need an expert to come and speak to your innovation leaders, you need training in the art and method of innovation storytelling, or you just need the support and guidance of a consultant who can get you where you want to go in less time, 
visit www.susanlinder.com today to learn more and to set up a call to discuss your needs. I'm so looking forward to connecting with you and to helping you tell a great innovation story. If you like what you heard so far, don't forget to subscribe so you never miss another episode and leave us a comment. Tell us what you think of this episode. We'd love to hear from you. And if you didn't like what you've heard, just forget everything I've said. <laughs>